Hey everybody. So for part two, uh, full disclosure, I took this apart real quick and popped these boards off because I wanted to get some parts to get on order so that I can kind of move on with this project. And uh, before I get into this <laughs> fun thing here that I found, uh, here are the old capacitors. And you can see they don't match even though they're the same part number. They're different colors. It's strange. They probably were made uh, 85G8124, 85C7703, so they must be different dates of manufacture. But, as it turns out, I found exact replacements, and they even came with the brackets. And they're 105C Nichicon. 100 volt, 15,000 microfarad instead of 10,000 microfarad. So a little bump in that, not going to make much difference. But these are super long life, low ESR, uh, fantastic capacitors, and exactly the same size. And the old brackets were rusted and ugly, just like the rest of the metal parts on this amplifier. And this came with brand new ones, and uh, I. I got them at DigiKey. So there's the part number if you want to look at it. I think that's all it says on it. But uh, I got those and whatever parts I didn't have to do this project, I made one order of DigiKey and bought a couple things and we're gonna do this upright. Now for the fun part. <laughs> I'll take this back apart. I just put these four screws back in to kind of show you how this goes together. And again, I did this one morning before work so that I could hurry up and get those parts ordered. So I really didn't do a video of it. I can't video everything because things get really busy here. But if you take this off, this space heater, as I call it, comes apart into two pieces and you can see all the transistors this is one channel this is the other channel and right off the bat you can see that the transistors are not all the same so you look at all the part numbers on this one and you can kind of see there and then you compare it to this one and you can see that they're different transistors so some of them are Fairchild, some of them are Motorola. So these transistors have been replaced in the past. Now, I was starting to get a suspicion, you know, with the blown fuse and all that, that there were some pretty big problems with this amp, but I didn't, wasn't sure. The other thing I noticed, this is exactly how it was. So I put everything back to the proper modules that they were on so the boards are the way they were when I received this thing. The first thing I noticed was if you look at this board the sol there's like solder mask on it like all the traces are covered on both sides and if I take this off you can see I'm trying to be careful here both sides, there are no traces to be found unless you want to put a flashlight behind it or something. But if you look at the baseboard, you know, or the, they call this the collector board, I think, you, you can see the traces. Now, when you go to this one, it's a different board. They have the same part numbers, and uh, this one actually has a date on it that says August 26th of 1976. So this is a 1976 uh, model as far as so far <laughs> what I can tell. But if you look at this one, no solder mask. And which is kind of strange, they're like two different boards from two different, you know, production runs. And when I take it apart, this one does have the solder mask. So it's almost like whoever worked on this swapped these two boards around. Because it seems like this one should belong here, and this one should belong here. The other thing, when I took this board off, I noticed that 
take a look at that. And if you look at this one, all the solder joints are on there and all the components are in there. But if you look at this one, somebody removed the solder from them. And I thought right away, oh boy, here we go. And I think what happened was we had a pretty major failure on one of these and they just threw it back together. So they put the wrong board on the wrong module. Uh, this one here is also August 23rd, 1976, if you look. So that would tell me that, I don't know, August 26, 76. So yeah, so these would go together because they're the same date uh, to the day, right? These are, so this board with this background, and these ones do not have dates on them, but they have the same part number. So you look at this 115-2022 Rev A, and this is a, where does it say that? I think it said it somewhere. But you can tell these are different. But the parts are the same. The component location is the same. Everything from that standpoint looks the same. The other thing I noticed was this board that was on here has resistors with burn marks on them. So you could see how this one has had some heat. These are film, uh, metal film resistors. But yeah. So let's take a look at these transistors real quick. And again, this is kind of the stuff I do when I start on one of these amps. I try to get familiar and I try to kind of figure out the story. You know, what, what originally happened to this thing? You know, what's its past? So we get an idea of what we have to do to repair it. So if we just go to the, I think this is the base. And again, And that's open in both directions, right? Yep. So, and if I go, I got a dead short there. So I have an open from base to emitter and then base to collector is shorted. And I have an open from emitter to collector. So that's a bad transistor. Looking at this, we have a similar scenario, right? And an open. So I go down the line, pretty much everything in here is bad. Uh, the worst news, even, is that this uses those TO66 transistors. Now, of course, I don't get it. They used... TO220s for one set, and then they use TO66s for another set. And uh, this is legit. I mean, you can see there's no mounting hole. Now, we could get replacement TO220s to fit in here for these, because these are bad too, I'm pretty sure, if I don't, if I recall correctly. But I believe I have these. I may not have the exact Motorola ones, but I have the, the same ones that these came, you know, that these came from back in the day. I'll dig them out. And uh, so we're good with that. And these I think are modern like TIP 41s or something that they cross over to. The rest of these, we can just use the MJs, you know, MJ 150, what is it? 15032 and 150, I don't, I don't remember, you know, <laughs> I'll put them up on the screen, but the generic ones we always use, they're way heavier duty than these high quality made by ON Semiconductor, which is Motorola. You know, that's what Motorola became. So they're perfect transistors. These were actually very low uh, transition frequency transistors. So I don't want to put real high FT ones in here because, you know, these things will oscillate, and <laughs> get parasitic oscillation. We could have problems with that. So I guess the goal is... We're going to replace all the transistors here. We are going to test the circuit boards. So I'm going to test 
all of the small signal transistors. I do have limited supplies of these too, so if I need to replace some, I will. I am going to replace all the resistors. Uh, they somewhat test good, but since they've had heat on them and we don't know what kind of torment they went through, that's going to get replaced. For the schematic. And again, uh, I have a printer that will print tabloid sized paper, which is the 11 by 17 size paper. So I print these schematics. People ask me where I get them from. I, it's the normal service manual that you download online at Hi-Fi Engine or uh, Electro Tanya, or there's a lot of different places that you can get. Some places make you pay for them. Some of them you just have to have membership, whatever. But I just enlarge it to this size and print it out. And that's how I do it. And on this one, I converted it to JPEG put notes in it just for my own reference and then converted it back to a PDF. And then I can view it online, you know, on my computer or I can print it like this. And what do I mean by notes? Well, if I go zoom in quite a bit here, you can see one of my notes right here where it says uh, right here, Q301 and Q302 unity gain buffer. You see where it says that? Complementary input amplifier. These are just things to kind of, it's good to take notes. And, you know, even if you don't want to do, take the time to print things out like this neatly, print a schematic out and take a pen or a pencil and make notes on it. You know, as you go through and study a circuit, it's, it's a good practice to study circuit diagrams like this to learn how they work and to try to understand them. It makes it easier for you to do troubleshooting and so forth when you do that. So, you know, just removing capacitors and recapping boards, you know, just about anybody can do that. And that, you know, I don't care how many stereos you recapped. If you recapped 50,000 stereos, you don't really learn anything by doing that. Uh, you luck out sometimes and it works, but if you have a real problem, this is the way to learn how to address it. Look at a schematic, identify the parts, and then try to figure out what it's doing. Um, at first, you'll struggle, but the more you do it, the more you'll learn. So anyway, this is a really unique schematic in that in the circuit design, in that this uses what they call the power stack. What do they mean by power stack? Well, if you notice, you have you have eight output transistors, so forget this part for right now. And if you look, the two at the top are connected to your positive rail, and the two at the bottom are connected to the negative rail, and then you have these other ones in series. They're series transistors. Now, this kind of reminds you of a class H or a, or a class G type amplifier, like what you see, uh, like what uh, Carver does. You know, remember how I did some Carver videos, and if you remember those, the they had stacked transistors like this. But the difference was they had a higher voltage up here, and then they had an intermediate voltage right here at the junction point of them. And these inner transistors would handle the low signal, you know, up to like if it was a 100 watt amp, let's just say, I'm just pulling out a random number, from zero to 50 watts, you know, the voltage that would be required for 50 watts into eight ohms, these two would, would be active. But then as you got up into the higher power, you know, to you know, 60, 70, 80 watts up to 100, these would kick in and handle the other portion of the waveform. So it's kind of cool how they worked. This does not do that, though. It's a little bit different, and it's almost, I would kind of say it's a relative, or I should say an ancestor of like a class H amplifier. Class H is where you have the rail voltage will modulate as needed. So the voltage starts out low, and the transistors work, and then as, the, as more power is required and more amplitude, then the, uh, the voltage will increase dynamically on the rails, 
and the transistors will switch, you know, the higher voltage. And it's all kind of a moving target. This isn't quite doing that, but you can see it has two sets of drivers. So I call these the primary drivers and I call these the secondary drivers. So what happens is they both kind of turn on these transistors together at the same rate. So you, you, you basically have two transistors in series that are turning on and off and it's kind of unique and they have a, it's a series parallel thing. So you have these two in parallel, these two in parallel, and then these two parallel pairs in series. And the whole purpose is to handle high voltage and high current at the same time. And to have a lower drive signal to drive these. So these are your drivers. So, you know, instead of having your traditional, you know, input buffer, which is unity gain, and your input pair, so there's no gain there. Then you have the, the VAS or voltage amplifier stage, and then you go into your drivers that take that voltage and amplify the current, and then those ones drive an even higher current output, you know, for the, for the main to drive the speakers. This is kind of different. Most of your gain is taking place just in this little area right here. So it's kind of, again, it's unique how it works. We'll get more into that as we start testing it and so forth. But I just wanted to go over this with you real quick. The other thing I want to do is uh, we're going to make some changes to this amp. I'm going to make it a good one to have for a home, you know, hi-fi, high-end audio for at home. This was really kind of something that I would equate to something you'd use on a PA amplifier or something, you know, playing out with or whatever, being using for a DJ or somebody. But we're going to refine this thing. Uh, for instance, the Speaker Protect is a circuit breaker. It's a thermal circuit breaker. And uh, see, 90 degrees C, and it's no, normally closed. And basically, if you overload the speaker, you dump a whole bunch of current into the speaker. It heats this up. This opens. But if you're talking about a high-end speaker <laughs> that you're using at home, <laughs> I don't think you want to wait for this thing to open up. Uh, I want a fast acting traditional speaker protect circuit with a relay. So we're going to add a speaker protect relay in place of this. The other thing we're going to do is maybe make some very slight modifications to the soft start circuit, which is already not bad. And then we're going to put a new fan in there that's quieter. You know, it's a little less noisy. I don't want to hear any fan noise. The only time this fan should ramp up is when it's playing so loud that you won't hear the fan ramp up a little bit anyway. And even when it does, it'll still be really quiet. Uh, I don't want you know, a jet engine <laughs> going on here because that, that might be good when you're in a nightclub or something. Not Definitely not something acceptable for being on your stereo rack at home. So that's the, that's the goal that I'm setting for this project. And uh, I'm going to get started by doing these boards because they're definitely in need of repair. So what I'm going to do for the rest of this video, I'm going to do the behind the scenes again. And I'm just going to go through all the components and test them. And I'm, I will talk a little bit in, in this one, you know, when I think it's necessary. And we'll go through and replace all the parts that need to be replaced and test all the parts that don't need to be replaced and hopefully when these are done they'll be built rebuilt and they'll look just like new
Okay, I'm going to use these, which are 0.33, 7 watt, 5%. So I'm going to bend these to fit precisely in here, and I'm going to leave them off the board because, again, part of that 7 watts of dissipation is by including the leads on that actually act as partially as a heat sink. And I, um, what I'm using is a bending gauge. And this is made by Pace. I don't know if you can see that or not. Let's see if there's something on here. There we go. Pace Incorporated lead bending form. And what you do is you loosen this screw, you put the two pins in the lead holes on the board. And that gives you the precise lead width, and then you take the, the uh, resistor or whatever it is, and you kind of put it in the little notches and center it, and then you bend this lead over, and bend this lead over, like that, and then that gives you the proper bend. So I'll do these last two, and I'll put these other resistors back in the bag until we do the next board. And we should be good to go. All right, to put this thing on there, I'm going to use a little heavier gauge solder, and I'm going to use my heavy-duty soldering gun. This has as much energy as my... Uh, Weller gun, you know, does, but it's just smaller. You can see how fast it melts the solder. But even at that, you want to make sure it goes all the way through. And I probably should have the vent fan going. I probably will put that on here shortly. But it, when I do that, it's so loud you can't hear. So, all right.
open. That one's open. That one's high.
Okay, so there's the main, you know, the big resistors. They've all been replaced. I have to say the build quality on this board is superior. This is a very, very high quality board. Not something you normally would see used for a stereo. It's extremely hard to solder on because the, all this copper and everything acts like a heat sink. You really have to have a hot iron and you really have to make good contact and it still takes a while for it to heat up and uh, to remove. But if you take your time, you can get it to turn out pretty good.
Okay everybody, that would be this amplifier module for the most part. Now I'm going to replace these potentiometers with multi-turns, but on one side they have to face this direction, and on the other side they have to face this direction. So I have to figure out which board is which. And the other thing is, uh, this these pots, if you notice, you can get to them from either side. Those are getting harder to find. And uh, these are single turn pots. They probably would work if I kept them in there, but uh, I'm not sure. I may leave them in there. I'll have to think about it. Everything else is good. Uh, the fact that we did have a couple of shorted transistors here kind of concerns me a little bit, but those other ones tested really good. These are a little harder to come by than some of the other ones out there. I do have some, as you saw, but if they don't need it, I'm not going to replace them. And these are so easy to remove these boards. If we get to testing it and there's some shot noise or some issues like that, we can always deal with that. Now what I might replace is these two here and these two here. Because that's the main signal path and that's right at the front end. These are all unity gain so there's it's just passing tiny signals through them. So I may want to replace these with some low noise transistors. I'll have to think about that. But if I do, when I do the other board I'll show that to you. So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me get it up stairs and start editing. <laughs> and uh, until next time, I wish you peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And we'll be back real soon.